here are six items you should consider including in your estate plan. A will. This is the main component of your estate plan and ensures your property is distributed according to your wishes. Durable power of attorney. This person will act on your behalf when you are unable to do so. Beneficiary designation. You want to decide your beneficiaries. If you don't, a judge might make that choice for you. Letter of intent. It's a document left to your executor or a beneficiary, and it defines what you want done with a particular asset after your death or incapacitation. Healthcare power of attorney. This will designate another individual to make important healthcare decisions on your behalf. Guardianship designations. If you have small children, you want to make sure you decide who will care for them if you no longer can. For more financial information, go to aarp.org slash money. Hello and welcome. My name is Sonia Gibbons-Reed, State and Community Engagement Analyst for AARP Illinois. AARP is a nonprofit and nonpartisan membership organization that's been working to promote the health and well-being of older Americans for more than 60 years. Today's virtual event is focused on taking a deeper dive into elder law and insights on estate planning by connecting you to resources on advanced planning that can eliminate problems before they arise and empower you with the information to plan. Today, we are honored to have David Lanier, an AARP Illinois volunteer, joining us. Welcome, David. Hi, my name is David Lanier, and today I want to welcome you to a virtual event for AARP. Um, AARP is a nonprofit nonpartisan um, organization, uh, which is comprised of members in the 50 plus range. Um, we currently have over 1.7 million um, members in the state of Illinois alone. Thank you, David. Today we will be having a conversation with Steve Anderson. Steve is a partner in the government consulting practice, Neckritz Amdor Anderson Group, providing counsel and guidance to entities seeking to advocate in the Illinois state capital. Prior to, prior to joining Neckritz Amdor Anderson, he was a commissioner of human rights for the state of Illinois, appointed by Illinois Governor J.B. Pritzker. Steve is a retired member of the Illinois House of Representatives and he has been practicing law, law since 1992 with a focus on elder and municipal law. He is licensed to practice in Illinois, the Seventh Circuit, and the United States Supreme Court. AARP Illinois welcomes Steve to today's conversation on elder law and estate planning. Good morning, and thank you, Sonia, for that kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be here with everyone. I'm looking forward to our conversation today. I do want to say just at the outset that when we have our discussion today, this is not going to be about Illinois specific law. We're going to try to discuss it in a larger context. Uh, most people will find that their various state laws will be a little different, um, not massively different. I'm not talking about you know sea changes between states, but there will be nuances. So I'll be talking in a more generalized way. And then of course, I encourage you if you have specific questions in a state uh, in whatever state you reside in, to talk with, with a professional within that state. Uh, so that's very important. But beyond that, I look forward to the idea of talking about planning. And planning is a available to people at any time. Don't feel like it's too late or I waited too long. That is not the case. There's always an opportunity, no matter what stage of life you're at, whatever financial condition you're at, to make sure that your, your senior years and your estate planning uh, can be maximized to the best effect uh, for you in an individual way. So uh, I like to, if there's one thing I want to leave you with by the end of today's call is that there are always opportunities. So don't, don't worry, you will, have a, you will have those chances and hopefully we'll discuss some of those today. So thank you so much, Sonia. I look forward to the questions. In the face of these continued trying times from inflation to caregiving needs, AARP is providing information and resources to help older adults and those caring for them. 
I am confident our 30 minute session with today's guests will be insightful. And if you would like to stay on top of the most recent and up-to-date information after this event, you can visit states.aarp.org forward slash Illinois. So with that, let's get started. Steve, what are the three main priorities when starting to address one's estate planning? So I think, um, and I'm going to take them in order of priority as well, at least in my opinion. The first is your current health and your projected health. Uh, because we're not, when we talk about estate planning, people sometimes think we're only talking about what happens to your estate after death. And while that's certainly true, I think the more important part is to think about the quality of your life prior to that inevitable fate for all of us. And, and when you talk about planning, while no one has a crystal ball as to our health, it is critically important that you have some idea of, of where you think your health is going. If you know you or your loved one uh, has an issue with health, maybe you know Alzheimer's is unfortunately very common, there are ways to plan for that. On the other hand, if you have physical disabilities or physical limits, there are also ways to plan for that, but they're not necessarily the same. So the top one is to understand to the best of your ability uh, where your physical health is at and where it might be going. Then number two, so that's number one. Number two is kind of the who, number three is the what. So when I talk about who and what, I am talking about where you ultimately would hope your assets might go, uh, you know, after your death. And so the who is anyone in the world. Uh, it might be your family members. It probably will be your spouse if your spouse is currently alive uh, first. But you know, there could be there could be others, and it's not limited to just you know your family. It can be. It, it, but it is absolutely whomever you want. It's not what the state tells you. It's not what your family tells you. It's what you want. So you get to make those decisions. That can include charities. That can include uh, friends, family, uh, anyone, anyone you can envision. Uh, so that's the who. And then the what is in order to do proper estate planning, we have to understand the nature of your assets. It's one thing if uh, your assets are all in cash, you know, after tax dollars in cash. That's one kind of planning. It's a different type of planning is if you have a mixed bag where you have that, but you also have retirement accounts that are pre-tax, if you have pensions, uh, if you have real estate, uh, it all depends on the complexity of your estate, what the right remedies will be. So I would say number one, your health, number two, the who, who do you want your assets to go to? And number three, the complexity of your, your estate and your assets. Okay. And does everyone need an attorney to handle the planning of their assets? No, no. As an attorney, I probably should tell you yes, but I'm, I'm bound <laughs> to tell you the truth. So the answer is no. When, when I said uh, that it depends on the complexity of your estate, that is really, really true. Uh, the introductory video talked about the fact that if you don't have an estate plan, a judge may decide for you. And that, that's technically true. But let's say that you have a very simple uh, overall estate um, and you have two kids and you want, remember it's your decision, but you want all your assets to be decided 50-50 between your kids. That, that's all that matters to you is just being fair between those two kids, not super complex. I still recommend that you get a will, but if you didn't or didn't get around to it, you know what a judge would do? He would, he would transfer the assets to your children 50-50 in virtually every state. That's kind of, we try to design the law to reflect kind of the normal circumstances. So the, 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 the real answer is no, everyone doesn't. It depends again on layers of complexity. Okay, that makes sense. We have a question off on YouTube. Uh, is a trust still relevant given the changes of Secure Act and Secure Act II? And if so, why? Yes, so trusts remain a relevant and important topic, again, depending on the level of complexity of your estate. Uh, not only does it avoid probate, and, and that's different from, from other things, uh, for example, Medicaid planning and things like that, it, it, is, it is not the same. But if you're in a situation where your, your assets are complex, 
um, and you want to be sure that they go exactly where you want them to go. A trust is typically uh, the best way to do that. It also, like I said, it avoids the probate process. We, we may talk about this later, but very quickly, probate is the court appointed process for distributing your assets. And that can be very expensive and very time consuming. And so a trust can eliminate uh, the complexity and shorten the time frame for doing that. But and there's a big but. You have to appoint people you trust in the positions of being the trustee uh, to be able to do that. So you, in everything I say, make sure you understand the people that are going to be working for you and on your behalf, make sure they know your wishes and that you absolutely trust them because the success or failure of a trust uh, will only be dependent on how well they can reflect what you wanted to happen. Okay. Uh, are there common mistakes that people make when they're setting up their estate plan? Um, that's a great question. I, I would say that there are a few common things. Most of them are based on um, assumptions. They're not purely mistakes, but they're assumptions. So it is very common, for example, for people to prepare a will or a trust and then forget that a lot of their assets are not going to go through either of those process. So let's say that you have a large amount of your assets in a 401k or a 403b if you're a public employee. So those are pre-tax dollars, although they can also now include Roth IRA money. But let's say for the most part, they're in those sorts of, of uh, vehicles, financial vehicles. Well, those documents also come along with designated beneficiaries. So when you create those, uh, those 401k accounts, you name right in there who you want your assets to go to. So if you do that, and then you create a will or a trust and don't make the same choices, let's say over time you, it's evolved and you no longer want whomever you named, uh, you're going to need to change that. And that's a very important thing to make sure that your will or your trust and those designated beneficiaries are the same. Otherwise, it may end up that you did a lot of work creating a trust that won't ever be touched because the asset's going to go to somebody else that you named maybe many years ago. Okay. We have another question. Um, what should I title directly in the name of a trust versus in my own name with designated beneficiary, beneficiaries? <laughs> So if you have a trust, and that, of course, is going to be a question, you know, because you don't have to have a trust. But if you do, you probably want to title virtually everything that has a title. So that means your bank account is as simple as that. Uh, and some people think it's odd to have a bank account trust instead of your own, your own name. But it's an asset, so you want it to pass through the trust that you created. Uh, so real estate for example, same thing. Vehicles, same thing. Uh, but the one area that you typically can't do that with are the, the items I just mentioned about the last question, which are pensions, 401ks. Uh, those are things you can pass into a trust, but they can't actually be titled in the name of the trust. They have to be personal. Okay. And so you're using the terms will and trust. Can you explain the difference? You bet. And it's an important one. So a will is a very, comparatively is a very simple document. It just expresses in writing uh, where you want your assets to go. So remember the who and the what, that's what a will does is you say, these are the people who I, you know, I want my assets to go to. And the what is here are my, my assets listed out or maybe in a more general form. And I want them to go to persons A, B, and C. I want the shares to go, you know, if you have three people, uh, maybe you'll say I want person number one to get 50% and persons number two and three uh, to each get 25%. Uh, that is what a will does, but it's not self-affecting. In other words, upon your death, assuming it needs, you, you actually have to use it and things aren't going by way of designated beneficiary, then it goes to court and then a court will process that. And that will cost money and it will take some time. A trust, on the other hand, does the same thing as far as those items of the who and the what. That all stays the same. 
But trusts are to designed for the most part to avoid the probate process and to shorten up the time frames. So instead, you transfer it, like we talked about, out of your personal name into the name of the trust. So it exists separately from you. And so upon your death, they don't have to probate or go through court with your assets if you've done it right. Instead, the trustee that you've named can simply take on the process of distributing your assets according to your intention. So one is court-based and the other is non-court-based. One is long, the other is a little shorter. Okay, we have another question from Facebook. Do you really need to update your will and how often, if you do, do you, should you have that updated? So in theory, no. Um, again, I do think every, uh, I like to say once a year, but it could be once every couple of years. I think that you should take a look at it, pull it back out, uh, see if it still reflects your wishes because your wishes may change over time. Uh, so it's important to do that. And then if you have the ability and the inclination to talk to an estate planning professional is good because laws change over time. And so maybe it's not likely if you're, if you're, asset picture isn't super complex, but there might be some changes that you don't know about that might affect your intentions. And so, like I said, if you have the wherewithal, once a year would be great. But you know what? It is also possible that you wrote that will 25, 30 years ago, and it will still be perfectly fine. They don't expire. You know, they don't, they don't, you don't have to do this. It's a good idea. But if you don't, it's still, it will probably work just fine. Okay. And can you walk through the differences between the two types of power of attorney, financial and medical? Yeah. So uh, both are equally important. Um, so the, the, the names somewhat give it away, but they are separate documents, at least here in Illinois. This might be an area where it might be different state by state, but the concepts are still going to be the same. So the first is a durable power of attorney for health care. This is your medical power of attorney. And you name someone or someones, you can have successors in place uh, in order to make decisions on your behalf while you're still alive, while you're still alive, but you can't make them or don't want to make them. Um, and so you designate, you know, it's typically a son or daughter or a, a, a spouse uh, would be common for that. And those will help that person interact with doctors, doctors, medical professionals, and they can make decisions on your behalf. And also, again, this might vary a little bit by state, but at least here in Illinois, you can designate how much power your, your uh, guardian, in that case, uh, um, uh, uh, is able to, to exercise. It can be anything from you can make any decision I could have made to only what a licensed physician tells you, you know, is reasonable. So you can, you can have very different planning powers there. That's medical. Now, if we switch over to financial, that's a durable power of attorney for, for finances. And in that case, it doesn't have to be the same person, but you'd name somebody else as your assistant there um, uh, to decide and work with your banks and your financial institutions. And again, it gives that person the same power that you have yourself. So if you want, if that person wants to, you know, move investments from one thing to another because they feel maybe the investment that you used to have isn't doing as well and they should change to a different one, if they, if you could do it, they could do it. And so that the two are separate. Now you can name the same person to be your healthcare power of attorney and your financial power of attorney. That's okay, but you don't have to. You can also split them up. I know a lot of families that have multiple children like to divvy it up a little bit um, so that they, they have to work together. Because if you think about it, a lot of the times, the two items, the two documents actually have to work in tandem, especially if we're talking about nursing home stays, uh, uh, medical expenses, you're gonna be have, having to work with the insurance company, which is money, but also the physician, which is healthcare. Right, okay. Uh, we have another question off of Facebook. What top suggestions do you have for notifying loved ones how, how you have set up your estate, preferably to minimize burden on them, expense and or process wise? Boy, that, that's a really great and thoughtful question. 
So the best thing that you can do is have a conversation with them face to face. I know that that sometimes can be hard, um, but I think you'll feel better after you do it. Um, if you're a person who enjoys a, a, a glass of wine or a good meal, do it over a glass of wine and a good meal. Uh, don't make it a serious conversation. You don't have to put on a suit and tie to talk with your loved ones about what you think uh, your estate, how you want to see things happen. So number one, talk to them about the future possibilities because they will be in the best position to be able to effectuate your wishes. Remember, this is not about their wishes. It's about your wishes. But if they don't know them, then they're not going to be as good at being able to effectuate them. So talk about those circumstances that could happen. Uh, you know, I'm not afraid to say, you know, that, you know, my dad died from Alzheimer's. So at the end, uh, he was not able to express his wishes. But we had talked years earlier, many, you know, many times about what he wanted to have happen. So I was confident with my brother and myself that we knew we were doing right by him. So number one is have those conversations and don't be, be afraid to have them multiple times. Maybe your, your thoughts, maybe you forget something the first time you talk about it, but then another time uh, you'll bring that up again. So that's one, but the other is also tell them with where you've made, done your planning. So if, you, uh, if you've used an attorney, give them the name, give them a business card of that attorney so they know where your, your estate planning documents are. I'd also, if you feel comfortable with it, consider giving them copies, not originals, but giving them copies of your documents so they actually have evidence right away saying, look, this is, this is what you know, mom or dad prepared uh, so that they're able to act quickly and efficiently on your behalf. I would say those are probably the two most important things. Um, and, and although this wasn't asked, I, I do want to say it. Um, the, the powers of attorney, even more than the trusts or the wills, the original documents can be important. So please tell your loved ones where the originals are. You won't typically leave those at the at you know an attorney's office. You'll have them in your home. But if you're if they're in your home, don't make your loved ones guess where they are. Keep them in a safe but accessible location. That also means don't throw them in a state safe that your loved ones don't have a combination to. So right. in a safe but accessible location that your loved ones know. Okay. Here's a question from YouTube. Pros and cons of using a bank as the trustee for single persons without trusted individuals. Yes. Um, I, I, th th so the last, the last little bit of that important part is, is what's key here, because I'm always going to recommend trusted individuals. Uh, but if you don't have one, and that's what the question is, where you're, you're not sure about that, I, I think that that's a reasonable alternative. Um, and when I say banks, I really mean financial institutions because it doesn't have to just be literally, uh, you know, First National Bank of whatever city you're in. Uh, you can use an organization that you trust, even though you don't have an individual. So maybe, uh, you know, there are different types of financial institutions. I'll give you an example, and I'm not, I endorse no products, I endorse no individuals. But I do a lot of work with Thriven because I'm a Lutheran. And so as a Lutheran, they reflect my value because they were originally called uh, Aid Association for Lutherans. Again, not endorsing any product, just saying that those are people who, for me, I know reflect some of my values. So there are financial institutions that do that uh, for many different uh, you know, beliefs and views. Okay. We have another question from Facebook. Can you have an LLC for real estate within a trust? Yes, it would. Uh, so to give a little background on that for people who may not be familiar with what we're talking about, an LLC is a limited liability company. So it's similar to a corporation. And a lot of people hold real estate assets in an LLC, mostly for tax purposes while you're alive for investment purposes, and for ease of transfer of assets. So that's pretty complicated stuff. But the question is, if you're using that during your lifetime, can that be in the trust? And the answer is yes, but it likely means that the, the LLC, the limited liability company, will actually be titled to your trust. So that organization, the trust, will own the LLC, if you will. Okay. 
Okay, so when the laws change, do we need to revisit with elder attorneys annually to ensure they will match up to new state or federal laws? So like, like I said earlier, if, if you're asking me, I would say a check-in once a year is great um, because the answer is, yeah, be, you know, the laws can change and can affect you. But most of the time, it depends on the level of complexity. You're going to keep hearing that from me over and over again. If your estate is very complex and the assets that you hold are complex, just like the question a moment ago about someone who might have an LLC as part of their overall asset picture, you're probably going to want to follow my advice and, and check in with somebody once a year because those sorts of laws could change. If your, your estate plan, though, is more basic, you know, where it's not that complicated, you don't have to because the fundamentals really don't change that much. Um, and I mean, I can't say that with any any guarantee, but for the most part, I've been practicing for 30 plus years. And the things I'm telling you today have been true from the day I started practicing. Okay. Um, if someone cannot afford the cost of hiring an elder attorney for help, where can someone go for that type of help with planning? Yeah. So um, a couple of options. One is there are oftentimes local uh, legal service providers in your in your area. Uh, for example, here in Illinois, northern Illinois, where I live, is a group called Prairie State Legal Services. Uh, they are not for profit. You know, they don't they don't charge anybody anything for their services, and they have a, a senior and elder law branch that can help at least to some degree. Remember that you won't necessarily um, uh, get the same level of uh, complex, uh, complex service as you might with a private attorney. But if you don't have a lot of assets, then that's probably okay. So that's an example. But also you can Google or search on the internet for local bar association near me, wherever that will be. And usually there's a county bar association that you can call uh, and they will be able to refer you to uh, potentially a pro bono attorney, people who do that for free. Um, and you can also Google your state bar association. You know, for example, Illinois, it would be the Illinois State Bar Association, ISB. A org. So those are all ways to find attorneys who might be able to help you either at a reduced cost or at free. Um, but the other thing I would say about that is, remember, if your asset picture is very low, it may be that the will or the trust is not that important, but it still is important that you have the powers of attorney for healthcare and property, because those you need regardless of your asset picture so that somebody can help make decisions for you when you can't make them at all, uh, uh, you know, alone. And a lot of people, a lot of attorneys will be mad at me for what I'm about to say, but for those two documents, you can even go online and there are, you know, free legal service. Um, they're not actually, you're not going to get any legal advice, but they'll get you to forms that you could fill out. I don't recommend it. But if the choice is that or nothing, then probably that. Okay. Well, this has been a great discussion, and I'm sorry to say we're running out of time already. Steve, do you have any final comments before we close? No, it's been a, it's been a pleasure to be able to speak with you. Uh, again, uh, the, the thing I want you to remember uh, at the end, like I said at the beginning, is it's never too late to do this planning. Um, you always have that opportunity to make changes. Don't think that this is an inflexible process. If your views and thoughts change over time, you can change those right up until the last opportunities. So make sure to remember that flexibility and make sure to communicate with your loved ones and the people that you trust. Uh, because again, the most important thing possible here is that they know your wishes, because this is about you, not about them. I mean, you ultimately might be giving uh, a lot of things to them, but this is about your wishes. Don't forget that. And I thank you all for the opportunity to be here and talk with you. Thank you. Thank you so much to our special guest, Steve Anderson, for joining us today. And thank you, AARP members, volunteers, and listeners for joining in this discussion. Continue to join for our virtual events with AARP Illinois. If you're looking for more information from AARP, please Google our website at AARP Illinois or at states.aarp.org forward slash Illinois. Thank you and have a wonderful day. This concludes our virtual event. Thank you.
Get your money ready for your next priority with AARP's trusted financial tools. Because the younger you are, the more you need AARP. Start planning today at aarp.org slash money.